Good morning to you. What a privilege it is to be able to join you in your homes and your localities, to be able to bring a word of encouragement to you this Sunday morning. Truly, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Over the next couple of weeks, I want to share a message with you that I believe will be very, very thought-provoking. If you have your Bibles and your tablets, let's get ready to dig into God's word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this tremendous opportunity we have to grow in the word. Lord, we know that the entrance of your word brings light. It brings illumination. And I thank you, Lord, that your spirit and your word agree. Therefore, Lord Jesus, right now, Do the work in our hearts that only you can do. And everybody said, Amen. Okay, loved ones, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33. And even though your focus is going to be on verse 11, I'm going to be reading a few verses prior to that from verse 7. So Exodus 33 verse 11 and the message I want to bring to you is called question time with God. I will read Exodus 33 but I'm going to start from verse 7. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp far from the camp and called it the tabernacle of meeting and it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting which was outside the camp so it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. It's quite ironic that during this season, we have this incredible opportunity to worship from our tents, <laughs> from our homes. The premise for what I want to share with you is going to be extrapolated from the text. And I want us to really consider what were the things that Moses and even Joshua talked to God about. Because I think that sometimes with a very rigid and religious mind, some of our conversations with God sound so man-made and mechanical. But I honestly believe that there are questions, there are conversations that we need to have with God. Questions that are going to liberate us, questions that are going to help us. Sometimes questions that will be the difference between us moving forward or remaining static. And I want to encourage you to create these moments where you can have a conversation with God and you can ask him questions and he can speak back in order to bring revelation to your life. The first thing I want to just acknowledge that over the next two weeks there's going to be two main targets. First of all, to acknowledge that asking God is part of a father-child relationship. 
If you love God, if you are committed to him, you should never be afraid of asking questions. Sometimes uh, with my eldest daughter, I reflect on some of the questions that she's asked me and some of them have been so profound. But what they have done is revealed the stages of her maturity. I remember one day coming home from church, she was about five or six, and she's in the car, relaxing, playing with her toys, and she just turned around and said, Dad, can I ask you a question? I said, fine. And she said, are you God? (laughs) And I said, no, darling. I goes, why would you ever ask me if I'm God? And she goes, because I've never, ever seen you do anything wrong. I'm sure she wouldn't say that now. (laughs) The point I'm making is that the questions we release, the questions we share with our Heavenly Father, they are critical to our maturity. They are critical to where we're at. And outside the realm of relationship, these questions may seem silly, but they are crucial for how we want to walk with God and the things we want to achieve. The second thing we want to do is recognize why questions often come in three realms. There are many more realms, but I really want to focus on three. Number one, why, when, and how. Why, when, and how. So the question is, does God ask questions? I'm sure if you are a parent or an uncle or an aunt, you'll soon realize that children tend to reciprocate the actions of their parents. And as someone who loves to study the Bible, I always focus specifically on the questions that God asks his people. I'm not saying that you cannot learn from the questions in scripture that people have asked God, and we're going to look at that. But you tend to find the transformative nature of a conversation comes when God answers or when he asks questions. And it's very much in the rabbinical tradition where a rabbi would often answer a question with a question. So there's something about us as children whereby we we tend to speak back to those around us, our peers, our carers, our parents, in the manner they've spoken to us. So what happens is that wisdom becomes reciprocated because you may ask God something, And then he'll ask you something. And there's this wonderful union by which we can grow as children of God. But it's really important that I lay a strong foundation because what we're going to look into may seem very controversial, may cause you as you're sitting in your home to feel uncomfortable. But I really want to start first from the perspective of God. When God asks a question, They are didactic. In other words, for those of you who teach will realize it's about teaching and educating. Teaching and educating. In other words, when God asks you a question, it's because he wants to bring a greater measure of understanding to you. God never asks a question for his own benefit. (laughs) As a loving father, it's always about you and with your future in mind. And there are certain questions that throughout the Bible God will ask. So he will ask rhetorical questions where he already knows the answer, but wants you to consider the process to the answer. In other words, When God uses a rhetorical question in the Bible, it is so that the question produces the desired effect in you, either to persuade you 
or to convince you of a truth. God also asks us deductive questions. In other words, God wants you to discover and know the answer by reviewing things that are happening to you and analyzing the facts. In other words, he wants you to know the bits of information that are relevant, but also the bits of information that are not relevant. Now, let me just part there. There are so many times when God asks you a question, and the reason why it's so crucial to understand when it's deductive is because the answer to your question is often blinded because of the presence of information that's not relevant. It's irrelevant. And you may find that once the irrelevant information's moved out the way, you know, you may be stuck thinking, well, how is this going to be? And, and God says, listen, you will never ever find the answer until you remove the irrelevant information. And when we do that, we're left with the relevant information that gives understanding. So God will question you. Right now, I just want you to think about how many times in your life God has asked you a question. Just pause and think about that. Because I'm confident that whenever you've responded adequately, you have seen a seismic change in your life. Questions are often God's tool to bring us into new places and to be a catalyst for us moving into something greater. And it's how you respond to the question will often determine whether you graduate. So some examples of when God would ask questions. Job chapter 40 verse 2. We know the story of Job that this is a man that experienced tremendous loss and tremendous challenge. But then the question that God gave him after Job literally started to put God on trial and question God, God says to him, shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? God was saying, hold on a minute, Job. You're contending with me. You're, you're, you're striving with me. Is your goal to correct me? And we have to be mindful because even though this message is, is challenging, we don't want to create a false premise where our questioning is about trying to correct God. It's, if anything, it's about us trying to get a measure of understanding and wisdom about what is happening in our lives and what God is doing. Isaiah 6 verse 8 says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall we send and who will go for us? Now, God knew who was going to go. He knew that Isaiah would be willing to go to the people of Judah. But what happened when he heard, when Isaiah heard the question, something resonated in his spirit. Something resonated in his heart. Right now, when you think about what's happening, and, and think about the context of Isaiah, there was turmoil in his nation. But yet God asks this strange question, who is going to go for us? Who are we going to send? And as you're sitting in your houses and wherever you may be right now watching online, what is the question that God is asking you? He already knows. And sometimes the way in which we are released into our purpose, the way in which we're often released into ministry, is by identifying the question that causes our hearts to move. By recognizing what is the question that sparks something in our spirit. 
that causes us to say, here I am, Lord. Like Isaiah, here I am. Send me. Maybe in this time of challenge, God is asking the question, will you go for me? Will you speak for me? Will you be a blessing for me? And it's these incredible questions that we find in scripture that help us to reflect on the majesty of God. Another question that God, in his dialogue with Jeremiah, he asks the question, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? God knows there's nothing too hard for him. But by asking the question, he wants to create a series of thoughts and reflection within yourself. Right now in your house, and maybe the personal challenges that you are facing, think about this question. I am the God of all flesh. I created man. Is there anything too hard for me? So when we consider these things, even in the time of Jesus, the questions that he would put to his disciples was trying to bring them closer to a place of revelation. At one stage he says to them, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? One translation says, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Or which of you by worrying can add one hour to their lifespan? These were questions that were supposed to trigger revelation. So why is it that every single one of us, maybe you're sitting there right now and you've said, I've given up on God because of one question. Or I've stopped doing ministry because of one question. Or I've stopped believing in a God that can heal because of one question. Or I'm, I've stopped believing that God can help me in my education or my business because of one question. Well, I pray that by God's spirit, we'll be able to resolve these issues. And I want to just read to you 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And Peter says, Beloved, think it not strange. Can you say that with me? Think it strange. Not strange. Why would Peter say that? Because he goes on to say concerning the fiery trial which is designed to try you, to test you as though some strange thing has happened to you. One of the catalysts for our questions is when strange things happen happen to us. Things that are unplanned. Things that we didn't bargain for. And it almost seems like a paradox because the apostle is saying, don't think it's strange when strange things happen. Because strange things are going to happen. Things that we can't always identify. Things that sometimes challenge the very core of who we are. So this week, I'm going to focus on probably the biggest question that believers, non-believers asks, and it's why. You see, when we put those kind of questions to God in the right context, why can be a tool for building knowledge or for facilitating our learning. As a believer, it's often the basis for a deeper relationship with God rather than an opportunity to accuse God. But how many of you are sitting there right now with whys? Why did that happen? Why am I like this? You know, there's a old series of films called, you know, Why Did I Get Married? And, um, you know, it's a comedy. But I was thinking more on a serious note that maybe for some people it's, well, 
Why am I not married? Why am I not a mother? Why am I not a father? Why don't I have th that career? And those can be challenging things. And if there's anyone that you should be able to bring this question to, it should be God. I don't want you to ever feel that you cannot bring these questions to a father that loves you, a father that understands you, a father that knows what you're going to ask even before you've asked him. This realm of why is so tough because it, it brings you to the point where sometimes you are so desperate, you're saying, God, I, I'm stuck, I can't move on until I know why. There was a man called Gideon, a man that appeared to be randomly chosen by God in Judges chapter 6 to deliver his people. And God sent his angel to, to speak to Gideon and says, look, God's going to deliver his people, he's going to use you. But listen to the question, the why that he put to this angel of the Lord. He says, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? That's, a, that's the cry of his heart. He says, okay, you're saying that God wants to use me. You're saying that God is going to deliver my people. But why then has all of these things happened? God, you've got to tell me why. Because if you were with us, then these things would never have happened. And what I find incredible in the text in Judges 6, verses 13 to 14 God, through the angel, doesn't answer the question. <laughs> I mean, God, surely, you know, we're sitting here, we're, we're crying out to you, and we're asking, why has this happened? Couldn't you have stopped it? Couldn't it, believers have been exempt from it? And Gideon is saying, listen, this is messing with my theology. Everything that my fathers told me about this God of miracles, this God of provision, it doesn't match up with what I see. Is anyone out there can relate to this? It doesn't match up. But I want you to note God's response. The angel doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't walk away from him. He doesn't dismiss him. But this is what he said. Gideon, Go in this might of yours because you will surely save Israel. You know what, Gideon? That passion you have, that, that frustration you have, I want you to hold on to it. Not let go of it. I want you to hold on to it because you're the, exactly the type of person that God wants to use because you want to see change but here's the revelation it wasn't so much about what God had or hadn't done it was God trying to reveal to Gideon that I want to save your people through you yes God is sovereign yes he is almighty he's omnipotent he is all powerful but the answer to Gideon's question when he was asking, well, why is this happening? Why are my people oppressed? The scripture tells us that every time they sowed, the Midianites would come and destroy their produce. And here was the answer. He goes, listen, hold on to that spiritual aggression you have because I'm going to use you to be the answer to your very question. Maybe you're sitting here right now with some really deep questions, saying, God, why? And I'm praying that as you are hearing this message, that suddenly something is resonating in your spirit, something's clicking for you to realize that it's you that God wants to use. 
It's you that God's going to work through. It's you that is going to be the solution to the problem. It's you that's going to make the difference. God didn't even respond directly to the answer. He just said, listen, keep this might, keep this passion. We go back to Job and we see in Job 3, verse 11 to 13, as Job began to reflect on the losses and, and personal tragedies, he, you know what he said? He says, why did I not die at birth? You know, he says, why did I not perish when I came out of the womb? He said, why did the knees of my mother receive me? Or why did the breast nurse me? You know, or, or, why didn't I just die? Because he goes on to say, I would have been at rest. All of these problems that I'm now facing, I would never have faced if I had just died. But you know, I love what the old Pentecostals will say, the devil is a liar. You've got to realize that you were born for a divine purpose. And because you were born didn't exempt you from challenge. And for Job, it was critical. It was a critical question because he was saying, surely the answer for me not having problems is for me to not be alive. But I want to just say to you right now, you need to be alive because God wants you to be alive. God needs you to be alive. Regardless of what you are facing right now, regardless of the losses that you might be trying to manage, don't curse the day you were born. Recognize that there is a plan. Recognize that God has a strategy to bring purpose and fulfillment and joy to everything that you do. You see, because God sees the end from the beginning, it's only in chapter 42 that we read in Job that God blessed the latter end of Job's life more than the former. I don't know who I'm speaking to this Sunday morning, but I want to say to you that God is going to bless the latter more than the former. You may have had a horrible former. You may have had a terrible start in life. But just because you started like that doesn't mean you need to finish like that. Hallelujah. Just turn to someone right now in your home, maybe your children, your husband, your wife, and say, just because you started like that doesn't mean you need to finish like that. Another question we find from the great psalmist David, Psalm 22. And we know that Psalm 22 is regarded as one of the messianic psalms. And when we read verses 1 to 3, we realize that our Lord Jesus asks the question on the cross. We often ask the most challenging questions when we're on the cross when we are in pain, when we sense that we're separated from the promise. And he asks the question, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why does it seem like you are so far from helping me? Is that you today? Is that your question? God, why have you forsaken me? Why does it seem like deliverance and breakthrough is so far from me? God, I, I heard about you, I'm trying, in, but it, it, nothing seems to be changing. But I want to minister to you today and let you know that if, even if you feel that God has forsaken you, he has not forgotten you. And it's only when you read a few verses on, again, you find that the psalmist finds the answer coming from out of his own spirit. You see, when we have those questions of why, we've got to understand that the Father knows the truth. The Father knows the truth, even though for you at that time, that's your reality. 
And when you read a few verses down in Psalm 22, it says, the psalmist, after asking that question and saying, God, you've forsaken me. You're not near. Look at what's happening around me. He says, but you are holy. But you are holy. In other words, you know what, God? I'm asking you a question, but what I've said is not consistent with your character. You're holy. It's impossible for you to be unrighteous. And the Bible tells us that God is not unrighteous to forget our labor of love. God, you know what I've been through. You know how much I've trusted in you. You are holy. And he says, you are enthroned in the praises of Israel. So the psalmist has gone from asking God, why have you forsaken me? And he realizes his answer comes in remembering the character of God. His answer has come by remembering that when we praise him, we are celebrating him. <laughs> And he goes on to say, our fathers trusted in you and you delivered. So he's now recalling and he said, hold on a minute. I'm not the first person in life to feel that they've ever been forsaken. Sometimes we may feel that we're the only one. It doesn't matter whether you are a leader, whether you are a minister, a praise and worship leader, there's going to be a moment in your life where it feels like you're forsaken. But just like this psalmist where he's asking why, he remembers, he says, listen, our fathers trusted in you in the past and you delivered them. They trusted in you and they were not ashamed. What a tremendous revelation. He's asked the question and saying, why have you forsaken me? But the answer comes by his history. And I want to say to you right now that when you read the Bible, don't just read the Bible of men who triumphed. Read the Bible of men who went through hard times and also triumphed. Tap into people's testimonies. You see, sometimes we could do so much more if we didn't just share our victories, but we also shared our challenges so that we can demystify what it really is to walk with God. And I want you right now, just for a few moments, few moments just to thank God for his grace to thank God for his faithfulness that even though you've had those moments where you've asked why, that he's been able to remind you that he's the same yesterday, today and forever. He delivered others. He delivered you before. And if he did it before, he can do it again and again and again. And that was the way the psalmist moved away from that question. He, he recognized that even if he felt forsaken, God had not forgotten him. There's some key points about when we reach that point of why. Sometimes it's not about why God did, but rather why you did. Just think about that. It's often not about, well, God, why did you? It's often, well, why did you? And there has to be a place where we reach a sense of personal responsibility and recognize that we need to be transformed so that the things that we do are aligned with heaven. Let me say it again. The things that we do, you and me, those of us who are sitting here today watching, the things that we do become aligned with heaven. So maybe you need to adjust that why question and rather than saying, well, God, why did you? It might be God help me because I need to understand why I did. And when we begin to understand those things, we find that why becomes an opportunity 
to move forward into knowing. Not just feeling, but move forward into a place of knowing. But there's another realm. Because I know that some of you this morning may be saying, well, it's okay, Bishop, you know, you've said I must go and ask God why, but he's been silent. Do you know one of the hardest things um, when I did my teacher training that I found difficult to do was to be silent after I asked the question. And I remember being observed by my, my teacher when I was teaching and he said, no, well, you've got to learn how to pause. And he says, I know why you want to quickly give the answer because it feels uncomfortable when it's silent. But he says, one of the ways in which you can help your students to grow is for you to be silent and give them time to reflect. Sometimes when you reach that point where you're asking why, it is not a reflection of God punishing you. He's actually answering you through, your, through his silence. It's to help you to discover that the answer is often already in you. It's often already in you. And it's an opportunity for you to start to deduce and think, do you know what? God is holy. He's faithful. D do I need him to tell me something that deep down in my spirit I already know? I really sense even this morning that some of us are sitting here and we're desperate to hear, but maybe you've already heard. Maybe there's already a word in your spirit that just needs to be stirred up because Isaiah tells us that when God speaks, he speaks with objectivity. In other words, his word that gets planted in you, it will never, ever return void. It must accomplish its objectivity. Maybe we're sitting here saying, God, speak, when he's saying, I've spoken. I've spoken to you. I've already ministered to you. All things are going to work out for your good because I know that you love me and I know that you are called according to my purpose. Be still and know that I am God. What has God already said? I want to close with a couple of declarations. And Isaiah 49, verse 15 to 16 says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. I don't know who I'm speaking to specifically this morning, but you have had a question time with God. And he's saying, listen, others may have forgotten. Others may not have seen what you've been through. Others may not have known the private prayers you've prayed, but God says, I will not forget you. I will not forget you. I know you have questions, but I won't forget you. I know you may have been away from my house, but I haven't forgotten you. I know you may have even walked away from ministry, but I have not forgotten you. I know you may have struggled with personal holiness, but I have not forgotten you. I'm still 
the answer to your question. I would ask you right now, what are your God questions? What are the things that are coming up from your question time with God? I really want to reach out to you right now. I want to pray for you. So right where you are, if you're with your loved ones, friends, one of the most tremendous things that we can do is pray together. The Bible tells us that the fervent and effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in the name of your son Jesus, we thank you that we can have moments where we ask you questions. We thank you, Lord, for these question times. But we pray that these question times will bring us into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, if there is someone that is watching today that needs to be restored to a love relationship with you, that walked away because there was a question that was not answered, I pray by the power of your spirit, you will speak, Lord. And you will remind them of what has already been spoken. Father, right now, help us to move forward knowing that you are holy, you are righteous, you are true. And we're not afraid to ask you questions because we know you are our Father. And we pray that your will, which is already established in heaven, will be established in our hearts here on earth. We ask this please, Lord.